so now we're going to talk about public key cryptography. It's a bit more, uh, more of the modern stuff. So the uh, first thing we're going to cover is key exchange schemes, because this is one of the biggest problems that we have faced so far. And uh, we've had shared key systems, which means that we have had to share these uh, keys between each other in some way. And um, public key cryptography makes this a lot easier. So it reduces uh, the problem. So first we are going to talk about key exchange schemes. Then we're going to talk about uh, encryption and decryption, and then go into digital signatures. And then finally, we're going to talk about uh, homomorphic properties of this, uh, these systems that can be used for other interesting things. So the idea here is uh, with key exchange schemes is that it's difficult to have uh, to exchange keys in advance uh, because you never know with whom you might actually need to talk. And uh, what if we could just securely exchange these keys at a distance? That would be lovely. Uh, and uh, do it just before we need to use them. Uh, that would be really something. Uh, so the solution or requirements for the solution is that we need a problem that's easy for Alice and Bob to solve, but it should be hard for Eve to solve. Uh, so before we get into how to do this, we need to look at some uh, computer scientific problems. So some problems in, believed to be hard in, in complexity theory. Now we have uh, the integers modulo sum p here and uh, this uh, star here me means that we exclude the zero so it's a multiplicative group and uh, p here is uh, a prime number. Now then this discrete logarithm problem is given uh, g and g to the power of x in this group, we should find what x is. So basically this means that we, we are supposed to compute the logarithm of g to the power of x in the base x here, modulo uh, p. And while this is easy to do, uh, normally for, for the real numbers, it's uh, really difficult to do uh, in, the, in integers modulo uh, p. And uh, this is believed to be uh, a hard problem. Uh, so there is no known uh, solution, there is no known proof that this is hard, but uh, it, the consensus is that uh, we believe it is hard. And then we have another problem uh, known as the Diffie-Hellman problem because it was proposed by Diffie and Hellman uh, quite some time ago, uh, back in 1976. And uh, here you're given uh, g, g to the power of x, g to the power of y uh, in this uh, multiplicative group. So the integers modulo p and excluding the zero. And so given these three, you're supposed to find g to the power of x and y. Uh, and uh, remember, if you simply look at these two, I mean, if you multiply them together, you simply get uh, g to the power of x plus y. So you need to basically know uh, one of these exponents to be able to, to compute this one uh, from the other. The final problem uh, that we have also uh, by Diffie and Hellman is the decisional Diffie and Hellman. And this is uh, basically a variant of this one. So uh, uh, an easier uh, problem. So here you just have to make a decision. So given in g, g to the power of x, g to the power of y, g to the power of z, uh, you're supposed to determine whether uh, z is equal to uh, x multiplied by y. Uh, 
So that is if G, this actually is g to the power of x, y, or if it's just g to the power of a random number. Yeah, so, so that's uh, something that uh, is also believed to be hard to do. Now, uh, if we can solve the discrete logarithm problem, uh, then we can obviously solve uh, the Diffie-Hellman problem and the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem too. Maybe the, 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 uh, the Diffie-Hellman problem and decisional Diffie-Hellman can be solved without uh, the discrete logarithm problem. Uh, we don't know that yet. And uh, we usually assume that all these three uh, are hard. Uh, hard problems to solve. Now, uh, Diffie and Hellman, they used the Diffie-Hellman problem to create a key exchange protocol. Uh, so take some time to figure out uh, how these problems can be uh, used to achieve what we want. Uh, take a few minutes. And remember, uh, the goal is that Alice and Bob want to exchange a key, a secret key, and uh, Eve should not be able to, to extract this uh, secret from the communication. Now, uh, the construction that Diffie-Hellman uh, came up with uh, works like this. So we, we choose a, a G here uh, in uh, among these integers modulo uh, p, so in this multiplicative group. And uh, at least she generates a random x, uh, so which is a number between, uh, so larger than zero and less than uh, the number of uh, groups, uh, number of elements uh, in this group. And then she takes g to the power of x and sends that to Bob. Bob, uh, on his side, he does exactly the same thing. He chooses a y uh, randomly, same as Alice chose x, and then he sends a g to the power of y back to Alice. Now, Alice has uh, x and g and uh, g to the power of y. Bob has g, g to the power of x, and y. So now both of them can compute g to the power of x, y, so Alice, she takes g to the power of y that she got from Bob, and she simply takes that to the power of x because she knows her x. And Bob, on the other hand, he has g to the power of x that he got from Alice, and he can simply raise that one to, uh, to the power of y uh, because he knows y. Eve, on the other hand, uh, she simply has g, g to the power of x and g to the power of y, and uh, this was exactly the input you got in the Diffie-Hellman problem. And uh, we assumed that it's hard for Eve then to compute g to the power of x, y. Uh, so this means that uh, Alice and Bob can uh, agree on a secret. Uh, so now they, they can use g to the power of x, y as a key. Uh, for a shared key crypto system. So they have just managed to agree on a key, although they have never met before. Uh, so they can do this uh, over the air uh, using some uh, communication uh, protocol. Now, uh, note that uh, this uh, protocol is not entirely secure. I mean, it provides confidentiality, but uh, g to the power of x and g to the power of y, they are not authenticated. So uh, when Alice runs this protocol, she cannot tell the difference whether she's actually talking to Bob or talking to Eve. Uh, so Eve might be able to, uh, to, to fool Alice that uh, she's Bob and she can uh, do the same against Bob. Uh, fool Bob that she's Alice and uh, Alice and Bob have no idea how to to detect this. I mean, they, they cannot distinguish uh, between whether they are talking to Eve or to each other. Uh, but we will uh, come to this. Uh, so uh, now let's move on to uh, 
encryption and decryption in, in public key crypto systems. Uh, fine, we, we can use G to the power of XY as a key in a cipher, but uh, it would be kind of cool if uh, we could actually encrypt the message directly. And this is fully possible. So for instance, if we look at the Elgamal crypto system, this is basically uh, a slight variation of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange that we just saw. It just includes the message uh, at the same time. So uh, in this case, we do the setup. We, we create a, a public key. So we select a G here and we select uh, an X, same, same way as in Diffie-Hellman. And then we publish G and G to the power of X. Uh, so same as in uh, Diffie and Hellman. It's just that uh, Alice has G to the power of X fixed uh, throughout time. And then when Bob wants to send a message to Alice, he chooses the Y, same as in Diffie and Hellman, and computes G to the power of Y. And then he has his message M here, and then he sends G to the power of Y to Alice, same as he did in uh, Diffie Hellman. And then he takes uh, G to the power of X, so that is Alice's public key here that she has published, takes that to the power of Y, and the result he uses to multiply uh, to M, so his message. So this is basically a, a one-time pad uh, that he, he uses, and then he sends this result uh, to Alice. Now, uh, when Alice receives Bob's message here, uh, she can take the first component here, g to the power of y, and she can take uh, this to the power of minus x. And uh, since she knows x, she can easily compute minus x and do this. And then she simply takes that and multiplies the second component here, uh, so the message part, uh, with that. And then you see here, so when she multiplies this, uh, she has g to the power of y times minus x, which is g to the power of minus xy. And this is g to the power of x uh, times uh, y. So that's g to the power of xy. So these two cancel each other, and she gets the message back. Now, uh, we have this idea that, uh, fine, if... Uh, Bob uh, sends a message to Alice, he's sure that she's the only one uh, who can decrypt it and anyone can uh, encrypt this. Uh, in, anyone can encrypt messages for Alice, but only Alice can decrypt them. Uh, now, can't we turn this around too? So uh, Alice uses a, the same system or, or a variant of it to ensure that uh, Bob knows that the message came from Alice. So if Bob uh, has a public key that he knows for sure is Alice's, then can't Alice use the private key to uh, sort of sign the message and then Bob can use the public key to verify that this message actually came from Alice. Now look at the El Gamal crypto system for a bit and see if you can find a way to run it backwards. Yeah, because this is essentially what we want. Uh, it's not trivial to do it, uh, but uh, take a few minutes uh, as an exercise to, to think about uh, this. Now, uh, the way uh, we change the El, El Gamal uh, crypto system to make it a signature uh, scheme is that we also introduce a, a one-way function here the, the one-way function is not uh, really necessary to make a digital signature scheme, uh, but we'll point out uh, later why it's uh, desirable to, to have it. So Alice still publishes her, her public key, same as before. And now when, when she wants to send a message to Bob, uh, Alice chooses the, the Y here uh, instead of Bob when he wanted to encrypt. And then he she computes uh, g to the power of y here. And then she computes uh, a value s, 
which is the, the message or the hash value of the message, and minus x, so that is her private key, so that's where the private key comes in, uh, multiplied by r, which is g to the power of y here, and then this whole thing uh, is multiplied by uh, the inverse of y. Uh, and then she sends uh, these two values, so g to the power of y uh, is the first component here, and then s, so this is the component here. And when Bob receives this, he checks if g to the power of uh, the message here, or the hash value of the message, he checks if this is equal to uh, g to the power of x, which is Alice public key. Uh, take that to the power of r, which is uh, g to the power of y here, so the first component that Bob gets here, uh, multiplied by r to the power of s. So uh, r we got here and s Bob got there. Now, if we check what actually happens here, is that, uh, so g to the power of x uh, times g to the power of y here, and then we get uh, g to the power of y uh, times uh, the message, and then minus uh, xg to the power of y, and then uh, y inverse here. So we see that y inverse here uh, cancels the y here. And uh, then we have uh, x minus x gy. Here we have x gy. So these two uh, cancel each other. And left is simply uh, g to the power of the message, uh, which was what Bob uh, checked against here. Uh, to see if this uh, is correct. And if that is correct, then Bob can be sure that Alice sent the message. Now, the reason we have the hash value there instead of just the message is that uh, if we don't have the hash value, we can multiply uh, two messages and still get a valid signature. Uh, so we get a, a homomorphic property. And that, uh, that is what we want to avoid with the, the hash function. Now, uh, this brings us into to the, the final topic, uh, homomorphic properties. So a homomorphism is simply a map, that is a function, uh, that preserves some uh, algebraic structure uh, between uh, two, two structures. So consider uh, that we have uh, two groups. So uh, we consider the real numbers and multiplication only. So we totally ignore addition. And then in the other case, we consider uh, the real numbers with uh, addition only. So we totally ignore uh, multiplication. Uh, if we let uh, G, uh, G1 and G1 prime be elements in the first group and G2 and G2 prime be elements in the second group, then consider the logarithm function. Uh, basically, the logarithm function uh, goes from R to R. Uh, and uh, according to the, the laws of logarithms, we have that if we multiply, would multiply G1 and G2, that would be adding g2 and g2 prime here on the other side. Uh, so that's a homomorphic uh, property. Now, take a look at the elga malcrypto system again and uh, try to see if there is a homomorphism there uh, and uh, try to find what, what uh, structure it preserves. Now, uh, the Elgamal's uh, homomorphism uh, is multiplication. So uh, say that we have two messages, M and M prime, and then we encrypt them under some key. So we have uh, GY, and then we have M, uh, and then GXY, and then we have G to the power of Y prime, M prime, and g to the power of x, y prime. So it's two different uh, encryptions. Uh, 
but under the same public key. So the private key is uh, the same for both of these. And then we multiply these together. So we take the first component and we multiply them. So g to the power of y, g to the power of y prime, these are multiplied. And then we multiply the second component to the message part. And uh, let's see what we get. So the first component here is g to the power of y plus y prime. Uh, the mes first message times the, the second message. And then we get g to the power of x, y plus x, y prime. Uh, and uh, if we do decryption, yeah, we have g to the power of uh, y, y prime here, which is the first component. So that first component here. And uh, then we simply take uh, yeah, our private key, so x, and raise this to the power of x. So we get x, y plus y prime. And uh, this is exactly what we have here. Uh, so we can uh, simply uh, use minus x instead and uh, cancel that term and get the message, which is then m times m prime. So, so in Elgamal's, uh, the Elgamal cryptosystem, we can multiply to uh, uh, ciphertext and then we, that is the same as multiplying the uh, underlying messages. So when we later decrypt it, we, we get the, the two uh, messages. Uh, we, we get the two messages multiplied, uh, which is an interesting property and can be useful in, in many, many cases. And uh, it's ex exactly this uh, property that we want to break uh, when we use the, uh, the hash function, uh, because the hash function of m is uh, times the hash function of m prime. That's not the same thing as uh, edge of m times m prime. And uh, another reason for using the hash function is so that we can have arbitrary length messages uh, otherwise, uh, they are tied to the to the block length of uh, El Gamal, so the size of the the group we're working on, working in, that is, uh, which is determined by by the size of the prime number that we used. And uh, if we have this homomorphic property for the uh, for the signature system, then we could uh, create a valid signature for a new message. Uh, without knowing the key. So we can take two, two different uh, messages which are signed and multiply them together and we can get another uh, valid signature. And that's uh, not good. And uh, there are a lot of different uh, cryptographic schemes with different homomorphic properties. Uh, so this is just one uh, example. There are many, many, many others. Yeah, so basically any homomorphism that you would like uh, is probably available. And uh, there is even uh, what's called fully homomorphic encryption, which uh, allows you to, to do any type of uh, homomorphisms and combinations of, of homomorphisms. Uh, so basically you can do anything with fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, however, at the moment, uh, the best known algorithms for doing this, uh, they are rather slow uh, in practice. So, so you don't want to, uh, to base your system on that just yet, maybe in a few years. And that was everything uh, for this session. Uh, thanks a lot.